Good morning. This is Professor Damon Fordham, and this is History 111. Now, in the last class, I was, well, before I, get, before I even get into that, I've graded uh, your tests, the ones that I've uh, been able to pull up, so that you should, so you should check your grades with that. The vast majority of you did very well, as a matter of fact, on this one. I see the improvement. So don't forget that your papers are going to be due on June the 18th, so in the meantime, uh, you may email me on any issues you may have with that at the present time. Now, having said all of that, uh, don't forget that your final exam is next is, is next week on June the 25th, and over the and over the next uh, few days, I will send the study guide for that, so that you'll be prepared for this. So, anyway, just keep up with what you're doing so far. That and uh, if you have any missing assignments, please I insist that you contact me on that subject. Now. Having said all of that, we left off talking about Alexander the Great in ancient Greece, as well as some of the bizarre kinds of goings on in later Greece that was that were among some of the things that would eventually lead to their downfall. And this morning, I'm going to talk about one aspect of Greek power during that time, which is the Maccabean Revolt. And from there, I will talk about a little-known figure in history because the language that he used was just translated in recent times. That is the great King Ashoka of ancient India. And I think you'll find his story pretty fascinating, okay? So after we deal with that, when I see you folks tomorrow, we are going to talk about the foundation of the one of the, great, the greatest empire of this period that we know of, and that is the Roman Empire that has a lot to teach us about what's happening in America today. But for right now, let's deal with the Greeks and the Maccabees, okay? All right, now the, Mac the story of the Maccabean Revolt is found in your major textbook on page 210 and in your companion reader from pages 182 to page 188. And I'm going to deal with an excerpt from a live description of the Maccabean Revolt a little bit uh, later on to illustrate what was going on with that, okay? Now, the Greeks, as we discussed before, Alexander the Great and people like him try, were working on a process called Hellenization. And Hellenization basically means the spreading of Greek culture. And when he was doing all that conquering between Greece and northern India, he spread, his whole goal was to spread the ways of the ancient Greeks and to have them assimilate into Greek ways. Well, Houston, we had a problem with that because by this time, Cyrus II had liberated the Jewish people and they were beginning to settle in Judea and the capital of Jerusalem, their holy city. Uh, but you see, the Greeks were doing things that were abhorrent to the Jewish people. For example, the Greeks were into public nudity in the gymnasium. They were into all and they were into that as well as their public art and so forth. They were into all of these uh, open sexual behaviors and such that were just, you know, forbidden as far as the Jewish people were concerned, and they were very disrespectful to the Hebrew god Yahweh, or what we would later be translated as Jehovah, or in modern terms, God. Okay? So, therefore, this didn't sit too well with them. So then the Syrian overlords, in 167 BC, they came down into Jerusalem and they did the following things in their major temples. Now this is in from your... Uh, Companion reader, pages of, uh, let's see, on page, I'm going to read from pages uh, 184 down to 185. And it goes like this, talking about, uh, after snubbing Egypt, Antiochus, the Greek leader, returned in the 143rd year. He went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary and took the golden altar, the lampstand for the light, and all its utensils. He took, also took the table for bread of the presence, 
the cups for the drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the gowns, and the gold decoration on the front of the temple. He stripped it all off. He took the silver and gold and the costly vessels. He took the hidden treasures which he found. Taking them all, he departed to his own land. His committed, he committed deeds of murder and spoke with great arrogance. Israel mourned deeply in every community. Rulers and elders groaned, and the maidens and young men became faint, and the beauty of women faded. Two years later, the king sent to the cities of Judah a chief, a collector of tribute, and he came to Jerusalem with a large force. Deceitfully, he spoke peaceable words to them, and they believed him. But he suddenly fell upon the city, dealt with it a severe blow, and destroyed many people of Israel. He plundered the city and burned it with fire, and tore down its houses and surrounding walls. And they took captive the women and children and seized the cattle. They fortified the city of David with a strong wall and strong towers, and it became their citadel. And they stationed there a sinful people, lawless men, they straightened their position. On every side of the sanctuary they shed innocent blood, and they defiled the sanctuary. Because of them the residents of Jerusalem fell. Her sanctuary became as desolate as a desert. And it goes on to talk about how they did all these abominations in the temple and so forth. So the Jews weren't so there was a Jewish family by the name of Maccabees, and they were not having that. So they riled up their armies after they put all these false gods in their temples and so forth, as well as doing all this mistreatment of the people, and they eventually drove out this evil Syrian king who was trying to put all of this Hellenization and this sickness and abominations into their land. And to this day, the Jewish people celebrate the victory of the Maccabees as one of their holidays. And see, that's important because, you see, keep in mind now, Syria was under Greece in those days. And in, at that time, the you had some Jewish people who did follow the abominations of the Greeks, but you had many who resisted that, and that resistance was an inspiration to the Jewish people, and it was also the kind of thing that helped bring down ancient Greece with all this sort of thing, see? So, having said all of that, we now move on to an empire that is very seldom discussed in history, because as I said before, the languages that describe them or among those that were not very well known until recently. You see, in ancient India, down the Indus Valley, between about, uh, around, shortly after the time of Alexander the Great, in the 300s going into the 200s BC, you had what was called the Mauryan Empire, that's M-A-U-R-Y-A-N Empire, and it was led by a leader by the name of Brace yourself for this, folks. Chand Chandragupta. Chandragupta. Yeah, I said it. Yeah, I'm getting better at this. Yeah. Chandragupta, who was the leader of this Mauryan Empire, because he was part of the Maury Empire. And he ruled from about 321 to 297 BC. He was of lowly origin, who grew up and he went on to use his military resources to reach westward beyond the Ganges Plain, and so forth. And so he managed to take over a, por a portion of Afghanistan and some other areas out in the west, of the western area. And he did quite well. But then he had a grandson that was even more powerful than him. And this was the great Ashoka. Who, uh, in, who in 261 B.C., he waged this dynasty's campaign of the conquest of a place by the name of Kalinga in the southern part of India. However, with all this brutal conquering, something happened in that battle of Kalinga. Word, he received word that over 100, over 10,000 soldiers lost their lives, and 150,000 Indians had been forced to relocate. And unlike many brutal kings of this time, his conscience began to get to him, and he felt a great feeling of guilt. 
And so he wanted to do something to make up for that by starting a peaceful empire. So what he did was, he was very much into the Buddhist teachings. And he had this idea that was called the Dhamma. That's D-H-A-M-M-A. Which essentially was a Buddhist idea that uh, the basics of it was a gent an all-encompassing all moral code that all of the religious sects were able to accept. And he required all people, regardless of religious and cultural customs, to consider themselves his subjects and to be kind to those of different religions. And what he did was he put his law called the Edicts of Ashoka on these huge... Um, on these huge towers that went throughout the, his rule. And they were written down just sort of like how Hammurabi did for everyone to read them so they would know what the law was. Now, some of this can be found on page 215 of your text. And he goes on to say that, uh, Beloved of the gods, it is those who dwell here, whether Brahmins or whatever their sects or households, to would show obedience to their superiors, obedience to mother and father, obedience to their teachers, and behave well and devotedly to their friends, acquaintances, colleagues, etc., and so forth. Even those who are fortunate to have escaped and whose love is undiminished by the brutal effects of war suffer from the misfortunes of their friends, acquaintances, and colleagues. This participation in all men of suffering weighs heavily on the mind of the beloved of the gods, except among the Greeks, there is no land where the religious orders of brotherhood is not to be found. And there's no land anywhere where men do not support one sect or another. And so he goes on to say that the beloved of the gods believes that what, that what one does wrong, when one does wrong, it should be forgiven as far as possible to forgive him. And the beloved of the gods, meaning himself, cons consolates the forest tribes of the empire, but he warns them that he has power even in his remorse. And that he asked them to repent lest they be killed. For the beloved of the gods wishes that all beings should be, should be unharmed, self-controlled, calm in mind, and gentle. The beloved of the gods considers victory by the Dhamma to be the most foremost victory. And moreover, the beloved of the gods has gained this victory on all fronts, where reigns the Greek, Greek king named Antiochus, and beloved beyond the realm of Antiochus and the lands of the four kings. And he goes on to list these kings and says, what is obtained by, by this is victory everywhere, and everywhere victory is pleasant. So he goes on to give some of these rules, which are in uh, your reader on page, uh, which is in your reader over here on pages 170, going into 173. And he go and listen to some of this, folks. My governors are placed in charge of hundreds of thousands of people. Under my authority, they have the power to judge and punish, that they calmly and fearlessly carry out their duties and that they may bring welfare and happiness to the people. They will know what brings joy and what brings sorrow, and comfortably to righteousness. They will instruct the people on the provinces that they may be happy in this world and the next. And when one entrusts a child to a skilled nurse, one is confident that she will care for it well. So I have appointed my governors for the welfare and happiness of the people, that they may fearlessly carry out their duties. I have given them the power to judge and to afflict punishment on their own initiative. I wish that there will be uniformity of justice and punishment. In other words, everybody's going to be treated equal. No one will escape punishment because of rank or anything like that. In the past, kings tried to make the people progress in righteousness, but they did not progress. And I asked myself, how would I uplift through progress and righteousness. This I decided to have them instructed in righteousness and to insist, or, insist ordinances of righteousness so that by hearing them, the people might conform and at advance in the progress of righteousness and then themselves make great progress. For that purpose, many officials are employed among the people to instruct them in righteousness and to explain it to them. So basically his governors are to go out and spread the word of these teachings of righteousness and see to it that the people obey them. But if they don't obey them, they will be punished. And that is what he considers to be fa a fair way of doing things. And these edicts of Ashoka, which I will uh, also send into a link, 
they require a lot of interesting things to think about. Uh, that, of course, some of this stuff will be on your final exam. But when you read these type of things, I think that even now, they might give you some interesting ideas, just as I hope the story of the Maccabees gives you some inspiration that if you are up against an evil situation, how if you rally good people together, good can overcome evil. And on that note, I will uh, post this lecture as well as some of the links to this, and have a great day.